on God's prophetic calendar is the rapture. That is the next thing that's going to happen. The word rapture means to seize, grasp, or grab. And it refers to Christ coming to retrieve his church, believers, who have accepted him as Savior. That is the next event on the prophetic calendar. And so that is the event I want to explain to you today about the rapture, the imminent return of Christ for his people. Jesus had told his disciples, I'm, I'm leaving. He's getting ready to die on the cross, rise from the dead and ascend back to heaven. And he told them, you can't come with me now, but don't worry, I'm going to come get you. I'm going to come get you. When the disciples heard this, they were traumatized because for three years, Jesus had been their leader, their teacher, their provider. He had been their guide. He had been their help. He had been their deliverer. He had been their whole world for three years. And now he says, I'm leaving and I'm, I'm coming back. In fact, here's what he told them in John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. St. John 14, 1 to 3 says this. Do not let your heart be troubled, because they were, they were troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That is the first specific reference to the rapture. I'm coming to receive you back to me. During this interim, I am preparing a place. That word prepare doesn't mean to like construct something. It means to make preparation for something. And I am going to come again. Now, our dilemma is he didn't say when. All he said was, I'm coming back to receive you to me. But I got to leave now. And so they were troubled. They were troubled because Jesus was not physically there. So they had to live on a promise. To understand this event and how it affects you and me, which by the time I'm finished today, your world should change. Let me show you why. First Thessalonians chapter four, Paul gives detailed explanation for this event called the catching up or the rapture. He begins in verse 13 of first Thessalonians four. He says, but we do not want you to be uninformed brethren. I, 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 we don't want you not to understand this. We don't want you to be unclear about this. So Paul is saying, let me explain this to you. Don't be uninformed. Now let me give you the reasons why this event that he's getting ready to explain is going to happen. He tells you the first reason in verse 13, I don't want you to be uninformed about those who are asleep. You and I would say people who've died. The biblical word that Jesus has introduced is the word sleep. Why does he use the word sleep? Because for a Christian, when you die, it's nap time. Okay? But I'll explain that in a moment. He says, I don't want you to be uninformed about those who've died or are asleep. Now the reason he has to say this is Jesus had promised to come back. So they're waiting for Jesus to come back. While they're waiting for Jesus to come back, some of their loved ones die who are Christians. And so they're concerned, well, wait a minute. If we're waiting for Jesus to come back and some of our folks have died, will they miss his return? Because they're not alive like we are. Well, that leads to another question. Suppose I die. 
Am I going to miss out on the rapture? So the question was, are folks who died missing out on this promise? Paul says, I don't want you to be uninformed about that. So one of the reasons he discusses the rapture is to inform them about how this thing will work with folk who are already dead. Another reason, which you'll see later on in the scripture I'll give you, is because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 50. It can't inherit the kingdom of heaven. In other words, you can't go to heaven like you are now. Because that environment does not fit your makeup, flesh and blood. So it is, you can't function like you are in heaven as flesh and blood. So a change has got to occur. So that's why the rapture is needed. Another reason why this rapture is important is to remove you before all hell breaks out, breaks loose on earth. Okay, look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. Now he's not talking about hell. He's talking about the tribulation period. All hell is going to break loose on earth. In other words, no matter how bad things are right now, you ain't seen nothing yet. All hell is going to break loose. And that's called the tribulation. So before all hell breaks loose, wrath to come, he's going to come to retrieve his people before the wrath breaks loose. There are numbers of illustrations of this in the Bible. Remember? He retrieved Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah before he rained down uh, fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. He retrieved Noah and his family into the ark before he flooded the world. He retrieved Rahab and her family into their house before the walls of Jericho collapsed. In other words, he kept them from the judgment to come by retrieving them. Well, that's exactly what Jesus is going to do for all Christians, all who make up his church. He will retrieve us before the tribulation comes when all hell breaks, uh, breaks loose on earth. So that's the concept of the rapture or the reasons for it. He introduces a word in verse 13 that he's going to speak and say something about a number of times concerning those who are asleep. Because he gives another reason why you need to know about the rapture. So that, verse 13, you do not grieve as those who have no hope. It affects your emotional well-being. See, there are two kinds of grieving. Hopeless grieving and hopeful grieving. Hopeless grieving is, I'm never going to see this person again. Hopeful grieving is, I am going to see this person again. Both are grieving, but they're grieving differently. One is grieving without hope, one is grieving with hope. So, I want you not to be hopeless in your sorrow when you lose loved ones who are part of the family of God. So, he introduces us to the word sleep. That's Jesus' word for what you and I call death. Well, wait a minute. If you are asleep in our normal, everyday nomenclature of life, that means you're not dead. You're in a, new, you're in a, you're in a temporary shift of state of consciousness. You're not, you're not dead. You're, you're asleep. You're in a position of death, but there has not been the move to non-existence. So keep that word in mind as we, as, we, as we go along. He says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Now, you ought to see a little conflict there. 
We're talking about those who've fallen asleep, i.e. died. But then Jesus is bringing somebody with him when he comes. So he's coming from heaven, bringing somebody, and the somebody he's bringing are those who've fallen asleep. Well, wait a minute. The folks who've fallen asleep are in the grave. But the folks he's bringing with him, who are the folks who've fallen asleep, are coming with him from heaven. So which is it? Am I in the grave or am I in heaven? When God made Adam, he created a body. When he created the body, the body did not function until he breathed into the man the breath of life. When he breathed into the man the breath of life, Scripture says, and he became a living soul. In other words, his body didn't become animated, active, functional, until the soul was deposited in it. Apart from the soul, all you had was frame with no animation, no life. When you expire, the life principle that God breathes in, soul, slithers in some invisible way out of the body. So the body can no longer function because the soul has departed it. And that soul for the believer goes immediately into the presence of God. At the time of the rapture, when Jesus Christ descends to seize believers, he is coming with you, the you that left you when you went to sleep. Okay? So, he says, those who are living when Jesus returns, not only do you not have to worry about the folks who've already died, they're going to beat you to the punch. Because when the Lord comes for the rapture, the taking away of the saints, he says, we who are alive, if he were to come back in the next five minutes, everybody in here who is alive will have to take second place to the folks who have already died. We will not precede them. You're not going to beat them to heaven. Even though they are dead, sleep, and you're alive. Well, how is all this going to work? So he wants to give you some details. He says, here's how this works. Verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. So at the point of the rapture, Jesus is going to leave heaven and there's going to be a shout. I.e., get up. Okay? There's going to be a call, a shout. So Jesus is himself. So this is a, a personal appearance. He's going to come with a shout. When he comes with the shout, it will be with the voice of the archangel. Now the archangel is chief angel in charge. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Because remember, the living won't precede the dead. The dead are going to precede the living because they're going to rise first. But wait a minute. I thought I was in heaven because I'm coming back with him. So if I'm in heaven coming back with him, exactly what's rising? Okay? Well, you are going to be buried. But not your soul, because your soul left. Your soul left at the point of death. You are going to be buried. When you are buried, most of us will be put in a casket that's sealed, that's under six feet of dirt. But there are other people who've died who don't get buried. Some people died in the sea. Some people died and their bodies weren't put in the casket. They were just buried in the ground. You're going to become worm food. So therefore, in order to get 
your soul coming down its new house to live in, there has got to be a reconstruction of you. You have to be stitched back together. You have to be, you have to be resurrected in some supernatural way so your soul that's coming back with Jesus has some place to hang out. So while you are coming back with Christ because your soul went to him when you die, the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's not your soul. Now we're talking about your body. You have to have a reconstructed body for your old redeemed soul. A body that can live in heaven and still function on earth. So when Jesus returns for the rapture and the shout of God is made, there is going to be a raising of reconstruction of your humanity so that you and your soul can hook up again. So you got you coming and a body rising. So the dead in Christ will be resurrected with new spiritual glorified bodies. I'm going to talk about that in a second. But that's how you will be resurrected. He talks about people, I love the end of verse 14, who fall asleep in Jesus. That's what he calls it. For dying, dying as a Christian, falling asleep in Jesus. So the assumption is that you have accepted Christ. If that assumption is true, then when you die, you will fall asleep in Jesus. He says, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. That, that's rapture. Caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Okay, now please notice where we're meeting the Lord. We're not meeting them on earth because it's not time for them to come to earth yet because we're going to be moving back and forth from heaven to earth, okay? So there's a two location thing. So you need a body that can go in both places. You need to be able to play offense and defense. You need to be able to work both sides of the ball. You need to be able to, you need to, be able to hang out up there and, be, and chill down here. You got, so so a, a lot of your time is gonna be spent on earth, not in heaven, okay? So he says we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. 1 Corinthians 15, and let's look at this just a little bit closer. Verse 51, behold, I tell you a mystery. I will tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we all will be changed. So everybody, dead and alive, are going to go through a metamorphosis like a butterfly emerging from a caterpillar. There will be a metamorphosis or a change. He says, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For this perishable will put on imperishable and this mortal will put on immortality. Okay, everything wrong with you will change. It will be a glorified body. Okay, well, well, I don't know about you, but I'd be interested to know what that body's gonna be like, okay? John says in 1 John chapter two, 1 John chapter three, verses two and three, he says, when we see him at the rapture, we will be like him, okay? We will be like him, okay? So if I'm gonna be like him, then I need to know what he's like so I'll know what I'll be like when I'm like him, all right? So let's rehearse Jesus' resurrection. When Jesus rose from the dead with a glorified body, three days after crucifixion, when he stepped out, 
he was the same person who died. Okay? He wasn't another person. He says, this Jesus whom you've seen, they say, is coming back again. So you won't become somebody other than who you are. So that's the first thing. So it's not like you're becoming, you're, meta, you're morphing into something else. Because remember, it's your soul that's entering the body. So whoever you are is what you will be then. So this is a whole different realm coming at the return of Christ at the rapture. And this imperishable must put on immortality and it will happen, he says, in the whom, twinkling of an eye. Quickly. The dead will be sucked out of the grave. New bodies to meet their souls, redeemed souls. The souls will enter into the new bodies for their glorified existence. The rapture is the next event on the calendar before God re-enters his program for Israel. He's going to remove us out before the wrath in order to recall his people. And so he ends in 1 Thessalonians by saying in verse 18, we will be with the Lord, comfort one another with these words. If you hold a magnet to something that has iron fillings in it, it's going to suck those fillings to the magnet. Okay, you put a magnet near something that has iron fillings in it, it'll suck it to the magnet. When Jesus Christ comes back, his glory will suck up the dead in Christ. Those who have the spirit of Christ in them, they will be sucked up in their new bodies to connect with their souls for their new glorified existence. So why should any of this matter? Number one, you should feel comfort to know when you're dead, you're not dead. You should feel just a little bit better that when you're dead, you really haven't died because you've never been more alive than you are in that second because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord and you ought to feel better and less fearful about death knowing that the thing you fear most is the thing you'll never experience. So, yeah, it ought to make you just feel a little bit better about the uncertainty and the, the fear that comes with death. Secondly, it ought to make you want to witness so that you don't have loved ones who are left behind. It ought to make you want to share the gospel to make sure on that great getting up morning, family and friends that you love and care about are sucked up in the rapture, seized in the rapture with you and not left for the hell that's going to break loose on earth in the tribulation period. In 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, he says, He that hath this hope purifies himself. He says, when you, when you know this good news, it ought to affect how we live. My point is, you don't want to miss this. You don't want to be left behind. You don't want to be left behind having played church. You don't want to be left behind having been religious. If you're here today and you don't know for certain that your sins have been forgiven and that you have received the gift of life, you got two things that could happen. You could die or the rapture could occur. Either one are bad news for you. So if I were you, I would run to the cross where God opens up his hands and says, whosoever will, let him come and drink from the water of life freely. He offers eternal life to every man, every woman, every young person who comes to the cross as a sinner recognizing they need a savior and trusting Christ as their sin bearer for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life. Don't let another day go by. And for those who are already saved, 
If God never blesses you with a, more, with a new house, another new car, more clothes, better job, bigger bank account, all that's fine. But if he never gives you anything else, you have a reason to praise him for your future that he has planned for I am sure that many, most, if not all, particularly if you have lived for a while, know what it is to have lost your dignity. To have done something for which you are ashamed, that you regret. And perhaps it's not only something in the past, but something from the past that stays with you. Because shame has a way of hanging out, hanging around with our regrets where we have failed and faulted. And you want your dignity back. In John chapter 8, we have a court case. We've been talking about the fact that God does his business with us in a legal setting. Jesus has gone to the Mount of Olives, but early in the morning he comes again, verse 2, to the temple, and all the people were coming to him. Jesus has drawn a crowd. And he sat down and he began to teach. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. And having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in this very act. Now the law of Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What then do you say? We've got a woman who's been caught red-handed. Her sin is been identified. And worse than that, it's been made public because she's in the court in the temple where Jesus was teaching and a crowd had gathered and the scribes and Pharisees put her on blast, put her on public display. It's bad enough when you're wrong. It's worse when everybody else knows it. Well, she's in public court. And uh, she's been found guilty by the scribes, who were the Jewish lawyers, and the Pharisees, who were the religious leaders. And uh, they raise the question, according to verse 5, about what the law says, because this is a legal situation. They say the law of Moses says that for this act, she should be stoned. What say you, Jesus? Now, we're given something at the beginning of verse 6. They were saying this, testing him, so that they might have grounds for accusing him. So they weren't just after the woman, they were after Jesus. But the accuser uses our sin to discredit Jesus. So the woman is put on display, but what they're really after is Jesus. What say you, Jesus? The law says we are to stone her. And it was a test. It was a trick. Let me tell you some of the elements of the trick, the test. The Jewish law did say you get stoned. But if Jesus would have stoned her based on what the law said, then he would have gone against Roman law because the Roman law wouldn't let Jews commit capital punishment. So if he would have insisted on the Jewish law, they could accuse him of breaking Roman law so Rome could come after Jesus because he broke Roman's law by keeping biblical law. But if he went to Roman law, then he would have rejected 
biblical law. If he would have said, don't stone her, then he would have been going against what the law of Moses said, which was the stoner. So he's in a catch-22. He's in what a friend of mine called the trick bag. He, he's in a situation where either decision, not only that, but Jesus, if you read the book of John, has been talking about compassion, 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 and deliverance and saving. And he's been talking about being compassionate. If he keeps the law of Moses, then he's not exercising compassion. And so he discredits himself among the crowd. But if he shows compassion and say, don't stone her, then he's disobeyed the law of Moses. Catch 22. They were after Jesus. It was a trick. It was a trap to bring him down by bringing her down. And so the situation is set. Let's go further. According to verse 6, when Jesus heard the question, but Jesus at the end of verse 6 stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. And when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him be first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones, and he was left alone and the woman where she was in the center of the court. Something took place in these proceedings. Something happened in the courtroom that shook up the deliberations. The scribes and the Pharisees say, we got her. She's caught. This is what the rules say. This is what the law says. You've been talking all this compassion stuff and all of that. What, what say you? What, what do we do? What do we do with this situation, Jesus? Because we got you. We, we got you now. Now, obviously, they didn't know who they were talking to. But something happened in this courtroom that is critical for me and you and us today to regain what the enemy wants to steal. John 10.10 10 says that the enemy comes to steal and kill and destroy. When Jesus gets asked the question, we are told that he stoops down in verse 6 and with his finger writes on the ground. We're told that they kept asking him the question, verse 7. He says, he that is without sin cast the first stone, and he stoops down and he writes again. And when he writes the second time, case dismissed. So now that raises the question, doesn't it? Because whatever he was writing and whatever he was saying shook the courtroom up and everybody walked out of the courtroom. So the question is, what did he write? Because we're not told what he wrote. We're just told he wrote. Then we're told he wrote again. But whatever it was, it was sufficient to end the proceedings. Maybe you need God to write something for you or me or us that will get us out this courtroom of judgment. But the question is, what did he write? Because we're not told. We're just told that he wrote twice. The key to understanding what was written is understanding what the discussion is about. 
The discussion is about the law of Moses. Amen. That's what they're talking about. The scribes and the Pharisees say the law of Moses said that this woman should die for her sins. That's what God's law says. Jesus stoops down, writes, and responds. So maybe if we just go back to the law of Moses, since that's what's on the, on the table, we will discover what was written. Dr. Evans will be right back after this important announcement. Let's go back. Let's start a little, little Bible study here with Exodus chapter 31. We're coming back to John, but Exodus chapter 31, verse 18. When he had finished speaking upon Mount Sinai, God, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony. Ten Commandments, tables of stone written by the finger of God. Whoa, 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 whoa. When I go back to John chapter 8, verse 6, Jesus stooped down with his finger and wrote on the ground. They're talking about the law of Moses. The law of Moses was written by the finger of God. God is the lawgiver. He writes the Ten Commandments on the tablet with his finger. They bring up to Jesus the law of Moses. Jesus takes his finger. Jesus said, you want to talk about the lawgiver? The lawgiver writes with his finger. He doesn't write on a tablet. He writes on some dirt. Because the woman has been called dirty. Okay, let's go back to Exodus. Chapter 34, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Moses, cut out for yourself two stone tablets like the former ones, and I will write on the tablets the words that were written on the former tablets you shattered. Oh, wait a minute. Now we got it written twice. There are the former tablets, and now these are new tablets. Why do we have a second set of tablets? Because between chapter 31 and chapter 34, God's people rebelled against him in sin, in evil. They built the golden calf and they departed from God. And as a result of their departure, Moses broke the tablets. Chapter 32, verse 19. It came about as soon as Moses came near to the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing and Moses' anger burned and he threw the tablets from his hands and shattered them at the foot of the mountain. Stay with me here. God gave them the tablets. The people rebelled against God. Moses broke the tablets. In chapter 34, verse 1, God rewrites the tablets. Why does God rewrite the tablet number two after they had failed with tablet number one given the sin that took place between the two tablets? Look at verse six of chapter 34. When he writes the second tablet, then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, the Lord God, compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness, 
for a thousand generations and forgives iniquity, transgression, and sins, yet he will no wise leave the guilty unpunished. He says, tablet number one, these are my rules. Before he writes tablet number two, they break the rules. God says, I want you to know something else about my character. I got the rules, but I'm also full of loving kindness, full of forgiveness and removing of iniquity, yet I still going to rewrite the tablets. I don't give up my rules to be gracious, but I don't let my rules keep me from being gracious. It tells him that the tablets are to be rewritten. So, it is in the midst of this, in between the two, you who are without sin cast the first stone. If you go now to Deuteronomy chapter 17, he says in verse 6, he says the first stone has to be from the witnesses. So the first people who throw the stones have to have be people who saw the sin. And it can't be one person. It's got to be two or at least three witnesses before judgment can be rendered. And you can't be a witness and hide. You got to be the first to throw the stone. You just can't be whispering in secret. I think I saw this. I think I heard that. No, you're going to throw the stone first. Because you are the one accusing them. Now, according to chapter 8, we saw this woman in the very act. So that means that there is some witnesses that can testify and that ought to be qualified to throw the first stone because you had to have two or three witnesses. Oh, let's take it a little deeper. Chapter 19 of Deuteronomy. Verse 15, a single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any iniquity or sin which he has committed on the evidence, but on the evidence of two or three witnesses shall a matter be confirmed. If a malicious witness rises up against a man to accuse him of wrongdoing, then both the men who have the dispute shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who will be in office. See, we're in a courtroom. The judges shall investigate thoroughly. And if the witness is a false witness, he has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him just as he had intended to do to his brother. Thus you shall purge evil from among you. Ooh, it's getting deeper. If you're going to be a witness and you're going to throw the first stone, but you are found to be a false witness, whatever was going to happen to the person that you were judging now reverts back and will happen to you. He says, he that is without sin casts the first stone. Deuteronomy 22, verse 22. If a man is found lying with a married woman, then both of them shall die. The man who lay with the woman and the woman, thus you shall purge the evil from Israel. Amen. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. In John chapter 8, only the woman is brought forth. But if you caught in the very act, that means there's a man somewhere, all right? But just like today, the woman is blamed and the man walks away. They bring the woman, but do not bring the man. They broke the law. I think what you got here is a setup. I think the man was set up to be caught with the woman, which is why he's not brought forth. He's part of the plan because the plan is to trap Jesus. So this woman is being used. She is being used for spiritual assault on Jesus Christ. 
It says when he wrote the second time. There had to be two witnesses. Well, there were not two witnesses. We're talking about the law of Moses. There were not two witnesses. Thus, they all left. Because if they broke the law, they would get the judgment of the law that they were bringing against the woman would fall back on them. So, because... They didn't want to be the first to cast a stone, which says I'm a witness, which says I know that man was there, but I didn't bring him in the court, which means I didn't obey the law. Then I'm under the judgment I was going to dispense. They didn't know who they were dealing with. Jesus Christ watches them with the lady. All go, all leave. Oh, wait a minute. Now we got a court with no witnesses. It is hard to have a trial and a decision if there is no witness. Now, this is not changing that the woman was wrong. It does change what was the outcome in the court because there were no two witnesses. This leads to one of the most astounding, hopeful, hopeful principles that I want to give you with, for me, for you, for us, to help you, but also to help others. Verse 10 of John 8, straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Your accusers. Well, I, I don't see nobody. Where are they? Did not one condemn you? Where's your condemnation? And then he throws a line out here that is awesome. She said, no one, Lord. Oh, watch this now. Not no one, no one, Lord. I'm submitting to you. Amen. I'm acknowledging you. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not dealing with people now because I'm dealing with you. No one, Lord. And Jesus says, I do not condemn you either. Go from now on, sin no more. Jesus did not release her from the reality of her sin. What he released her from was the condemnation of the consequences of her sin. Because it was a death penalty. Jesus in this courtroom becomes her advocate. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, John 10.10. 10. But Jesus says, I have come to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. John chapter 3, verse 17. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might have life through him. Amen. Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. He tells the woman... Since there are no witnesses, I don't condemn you. Not because you didn't sin, but because I must invoke my law. And because my law has been breached, there are no witnesses. I am not going to hold against you what you legitimately deserve. And the biblical word is mercy. I do not condemn you. Now, here's what you need to know. This is very important. He does not say, sin no more so that you don't be condemned. He says, you are not condemned, sin no more. He doesn't say, get right so that I can accept you. He says, I accept you, so get right.
One of the reasons that we don't get right is we don't value the acceptance that we have in Jesus Christ. We don't value the cross. And because we don't value the fact that he didn't and doesn't operate with us in a spirit of condemnation, we go and keep sinning. He says, you're not condemned. He says, and neither do I. I want you to stop sinning because you appreciate mercy. I want you to stop sinning because you value my goodness to you. And mercy triumphs over judgment. I hope you know your value. If you've accepted Jesus Christ, you are a blood-bought child of the living God. Jesus thought well enough for you, well enough for me, and well enough for us to die on the cross in our place for our sins. And not only that, but he says, you don't have to earn my acceptance. I'm going to accept you anyway. I just want to see how much you appreciate it. Case dismissed. Case dismissed. You are now free because this courtroom proceeding is over. You know the best way to make sure your case is dismissed? Leave here today with thanksgiving. Leave here today with gratitude. Leave here today with appreciation that you didn't get what you could have gotten if God would have let your accusers have their way. You would not be here today, but in his grace and mercy, you stand in this house with the privilege of worshiping, serving, and obeying your great king. Because guess what he said about you? Every time the devil shows up, case